Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. I'm talking with Chris Volk, and we've uh, it's taken us a while to get together, Chris, and uh, it's so it's it's very worth it. Thanks so much. And your book just came out when? Uh, the book just came out on May 10th. It's been out for about 10 days. May 10th. And I think we started trying to get together uh, a month or so ago. Uh, and uh, it's available now, folks. And so it's called The Value Equation. And uh, uh, talk about, elaborate on the fact what you said earlier was the companies that you've started, you know, you've got this information, you've had it percolate in your head, and then you had it uh, in writing the book, it, the applications really came clear to you. And now you've had experience starting companies with this knowledge, almost makes you dangerous, Chris. And uh, <laughs> in a world where most companies fail, you've got yours throwing off excess cash in six months. Give us an example of that and how you set it up and how you how you set it up where uh, the odds were stacked. You know, it's, it's kind of like this. I, it's a phrase I use all the time. Success is never guaranteed, but you can sure stack the odds of success in your favor. And you can continue to improve it, to continue to increase those odds to where it eventually becomes almost inevitable, you know? Uh, things can always go wrong at the finish line, but there's a lot you can do to set yourself up for success. And that's what I'm liking, what I'm hearing about uh, the uh, value equation formula and book. So how did you use that information and set these companies up? Can you give us some examples? Well, sure. The, the business that I've been in for the last um, 30 plus years has been doing um, either mortgages or more particularly sale leasebacks on real estate. So we would go off and buy a piece of real estate and we would rent it uh, to the restaurant chain that was using it or to the veterinary clinic that was using it. So, uh, and we, in our last company, focused solely on profit center real estate. That is a store capital that we started. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, this, and this gets into the issue of what's a product and a solution. If you're, if an investor looks at the balance sheet of store capital and they look at the left side of the sheet where everybody likes to look, they're going to see a truckload of real estate. They'll see $10 billion plus worth of real estate. And they'll think, well, this company's in the real estate business. You know, I mean, uh, um, but that's not it at all. You know, that uh, the reason store has all that real estate is because its tenants uh, have a choice of whether they own the real estate and finance it conventionally or they rent it. And so I spent the better part of my career convincing people they were better off not owning the real estate, but renting it. And um, because it added more value to their business, it would make them richer. And then I had to convince them that we were the best guys to rent it from. You know? So there are other landlords. So it's a double, double sale. Um, and then when you own the real estate, of course, uh, now you can attract investors because you now have this stream of cash flow and dividends coming in. And your yeah. investors like the cash flow and they like the dividends and they like the rent growth. And, uh, and so we were able to do that. And um, uh, so given that that was the business, then we could model it out um, and, uh, and get pretty close to exactly what was going to happen. When I would do um, my investor day presentations at store capital, I would uh, whittle the model down to 14 variables. I mean, I, I mean, and, and by that time it was a company that had, uh, you know, well, you know, over $9 billion worth of assets and about 100 employees and, uh, you know, north of half of the $600 million plus worth of revenues. And you can whittle it down to, to, you know, 14 variables. So the idea is to try to take stuff and, and make it as simple as you possibly can for people and, and for us, you know, uh, to do the same thing. And, um, uh, and then we were able to, with that knowledge, do several things. And one was to um, make our investments generating returns that were higher than what equity investors would expect. Um, yeah. And uh, so if you wanna create wealth from thin air, if you want a company to be worth more than it costs, 
the prerequisite to that is to generate a return that's higher than your cost of equity. And, um, uh, and uh, so investors might want a 10% return, but you're able to generate a 40% return or something like that, which is oftentimes what happens with, with high tech businesses where they come in and they can make just outlandish rates of return. I would say that the returns for Google and Facebook much, much higher than that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so the, the appreciation in these businesses isn't because the assets are worth more. It's not because the real estate's worth more that we did. It's because the returns and the business model are good enough to be able to generate returns uh, that are higher than what investors want. So when we had our first round of investors at store and they put up the money in 2011, when they got out in 2016, they made a 26% rate of return. Yeah. Pretty pretty solid for a real estate investment. That's just, I mean, they didn't have to develop anything. We didn't have to get entitlement. We didn't have to do anything, right? I mean, we were uh, yeah. just a hand, handful of people putting together a real estate uh, company, a finance company, but it was all based upon uh, understanding the returns that we could generate and generating returns that were attractive enough uh, so that when they sold out, they sold out to people wanting a lesser rate of return. Um, and so, and, and they, in the, Words of business, you're basically buying wholesale and you're selling retail, you know, and, that, and uh, that's yeah. what we did. Yeah, and the, cent the center of this was the value equation of how you set that up. Uh, the value equation uh, was in the back of my mind for sure. I mean, it was, it was, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. And, and not only that, but, but uh, because uh, our companies over the years were uh, going to middle market companies around the country uh, to be our tenants. Um, and uh, so we were soliciting them like you would a bank soliciting a customer. Um, uh, you know, we would uh, use the value equation periodically to sort of understand how good our tenants businesses were. Because you want to be able to, if, you're, if right. you're lending money to people, it's sure nice to know that your tenants have a heck of a nice business model that can generate wealth uh, for other people. So, uh, so I, you know, I find that a, the health of a business is oftentimes reflected in how strong their business model is, not just ours. Yeah, and those fourteen variables you would start off your presentation with uh, are those. Is that something that's covered in your book, or is that that just is not that... The, the 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 book actually just whittles it down to six variables. So, uh -huh. um, so it gets even more basic, you know. Um, right. Uh, but the book will also guide you on how to make it more complicated. That's what you want to do. So, for example, the six variables are kind of an abstraction. You know, I mean, it's getting the business down to its fewest components. But behind each of the six variables are, you know, uh, mathematic equations that you can create uh, that would incorporate many more variables if you want to. It's up to the person running the business and what they want to do. How did you refine your sales pitch? to get people to decide it was better for them to rent than to own. How did you, and it, you had to get that, get them over that hurdle uh, for them to want to be renting from you. For those of you who are sick and tired of fooling around and are dead serious about wanting to move up fast, I've got something especially for you. I've combined the best insights from over 40 years in business and making $70 million in income and compress them into a free webinar. That's right. It's a free resource. If you want to find out exactly what the concepts are that I use in coaching million dollar earners, register now at WhiteLOnWinning.com. You'll discover the five part framework used by so many to reach their financial, personal, and professional goals. You can find that link in this episode's show notes. Um, the first part was easy, which is that if they're going to own it, then they have to find decent financing to own it. Um, yeah. And I think that given a choice, I would suggest that people own the real estate, don't rent it. But the problem is that the financing out there is so awful um, that okay. it's hard for people to really um, choose that and think it's the best choice for them. Um, and part of it's because um, when you go out and borrow money, uh, lenders are asking people to tie up 30 to 40 percent of, of the value of the real estate and equity, right? And if you do that, you're depriving yourself of the ability to put that 30 to 40 percent to work in the business that you have, you know, and, yeah. and the businesses generally produce returns that are far, far higher than the returns we ever got, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, and so 
you know, I'm one of the things I was always grateful for was that we created a ton of man errors and the companies that we were able to finance because they were able to use our capital instead of theirs. And then they were able to take their capital and whirl it back into their business, which generated higher rates of return and allowed them to become rich. Yeah. What do you think is the reason so many companies out there don't have a good model? They don't go to the trouble of putting together the right business model. Is that uh, uh, neglect? Is it uh, uh, some kind of flaw in education? I mean, is that even discussed in education that much in the, these MBAs or people get an idea, they start, where do you see the breakdown uh, on that? Yeah, so I got an MBA. Um... And I did it at night school at Georgia State when I was working at the bank and um, went I'm through. Georgia, I'm a Georgia Tech guy myself. So is that right? I, okay. Yeah. A little bit uh, of... So I was, da- I was down the street. So, but um, yeah. I, uh, you know, I went through four years of night school because they didn't have executive MBAs back then. So it was a full slog. And I got out of the four years of night school without really understanding why some businesses are bit worth more than others. You know, why do, I mean, when I was at the bank, I started figuring out, you know, some businesses are just flat better than others. I mean, they have better business models. And uh, and I got out of business school without really a good understanding of why some businesses create a lot of wealth and other businesses just don't, you know. And, uh, uh, and so over the years, it was kind of a passion of mine to try to figure out why that was, you know. And, um, and so the value equation is sort of the culmination of that. And... Uh, um, and you're right that business schools just don't teach it that way. I mean, uh, so I would say what's in this book is going to be different from what people, if you've, if you've got an MBA and you've got a, got the degree, uh, what's in this book is something you haven't seen. Um, it's it's uh, different. Um, um, if you uh, don't have an MBA and you're reading this book, um, that's probably actually better because you hadn't had your mind cluttered yeah. with all the stuff that you learned while they were teaching you the MBA. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, and, you know, the thing is, it's not that difficult. And, and as, as I was talking to you previously, it comes down to leaders controlling three efficiencies that they got at their fingertips. And one being their operating efficiency, the pricing and cost control side of the business. Uh, the other being uh, controlling the, the business investment they got to make. Um, and the last one being uh, trying to understand how to uh, minimize the cost of money you got to use from other equity providers and lenders and lease providers, uh, you know, how you minimize that cost as well, but also at the same time, make your business flexible enough to run because flexibility is key, you know, um, and you got to have always access to liquidity. I, I, you know, all the businesses out there in the world that failed didn't fail because they lost money. They failed because they ran out of cash. So you all, you have to sort of make sure you uh, have margins for error. Um, in the book, there's a story about uh, Damon John, who's a pretty famous guy, and he's on Shark Tank. And uh, and Damon uh, is an excellent public speaker and goes out and presents to businesses, and he presented to our conference that we put on. And, uh, and one of the things that he talked about was that uh, when he created his company, he didn't really understand what business investment was. I mean, uh, he just didn't have a clue. I mean... Uh, uh, so uh, he had a certain amount of money to start off with. And then um, uh, what would almost killed him was that he sold all his uh, initial product out, but he had 60 day terms. So basically he swapped out his inventory for a 60 day loan and he didn't have the money to lend somebody money for 60 days. You know, he needed the money now. And, uh, and so that, that loan, that account receivable ended up being in this investment he had to make and he didn't figure it out, you know, so um, so as you're looking through the book, it sort of walks you through piece by piece what the components are uh, and how to create a business and understand it. Now, uh, what would he, what, what was he bringing? You know, when Damon Johns comes in to speak, what's he bringing? to where were you i mean what was this thing it was your your company did you bring him in as a speaker did you go to a conference um yeah we bought him as a a speaker at a conference that we put on for our customers so it was a educational conference uh designed to 
help our customers. And, uh, and we would do this once a year to give them uh, information that they could use to run their businesses better. And also uh, an ability to network with other people and other businesses that were similar uh, to be able to get ideas and share, share stories. And, uh, uh, and so uh, Damon was a speaker at one of the events and I thought it was really appropriate as he talked about um, how he almost went out of business um, uh, as he's starting his company. And he was um, very honest and, and humble about it. And, um, uh, and when I listened to him say, do that, I knew that I had a chapter in my book dedicated to that. So I did, did it. Yeah. You know, the thing about it, people feel that successful people are just arrogant SOBs and this, that, and the other. They don't understand successful people have gotten there after so many failures and run into so many brick walls that there's a human, you know, they really understand what it is to get beat down, you know? Right. So like Elon Musk says, all my heroes uh, told me I was crazy. You know, all of my heroes told me I was wrong. You know, he said, I've had nothing but abuse and rejection my entire life. It's funny. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, I basically started uh, similar companies. Uh, I took one pump plug and started two similar companies uh, sequentially and just got better at, it. you know, I mean, so you um, uh, so by the time, uh, we were starting the third one, I had a pretty good idea of what to do. And I, I'd, I'd been there and done it before. And, uh, and so you're taking less risk and you're, and there's less, far less luck involved in that. I mean, uh, uh, most entrepreneurs, uh, try as hard as they can to make their luck. Um, yeah. uh, I think that, uh, if someone becomes a billion dollars, you know, worth a billion dollars, or if somebody becomes worth a lot of money, there's generally some luck in that. Um, because, yeah most of those people don't really um, understand at the time that they're starting their business, how great those businesses are going to be. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And, yeah. and they become that great, uh, you know, sometimes for reasons owing to luck, you know, um, uh, but all those people would have been rich in any case, you know, I mean, uh, right. uh, they may not have been billionaires, but they would have all been uh, rich. And I think that there's kind of a brotherhood slash sisterhood of entrepreneurs uh, and anybody who's ever tried to start a business or work for a business that's starting up understands what it takes. And the differences, it's, the things that separate us tend to be fairly small, but they're related to business models, how big the problems we're solving, how big the markets are that we address. Um, those things sort of separate the uh, richest entrepreneurs from those that are less rich, you know. Um, but uh, in either case, uh, no matter whether you're at the top of the food chain or you're or, or you're at the bottom of the food chain, you can make an awful lot of money uh, starting a business if you know how to do it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, really, really good stuff. Really fun talking about uh, making, you know, what makes businesses work and what doesn't, you know. And so, uh, you know, there's lessons we all have to learn and nobody knows them all. But, uh, you know, you like you say, the more you get out involved in it, the experience you pick up, you can move more in setting things up for success and not have to depend on the luck so much, you know, running by the seat of your pants uh, type thing, taking, minimizing the element of risk. You can never take it all out because there's always some kind of surprise. I'm sure in around the world where they've had volcanoes erupt and, you know, hurricanes come in and, you know, they've had a, uh, uh, two feet of rain come in out of the blue, you know, and, you know, uh, or, or, or yeah. pandemics, right? <laughs> yeah, so, or, so, or pandemics. Yeah. You know, yeah. Don't ever get so airy. You say, we got this, you know? Yeah. You know, whenever someone says, we got this, uh, watch out. So uh, thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealamwinning.com. Thanks for listening.